I'm really grateful uh, to be here, really grateful to the Institute for hosting me, and uh, most importantly, grateful to all of you. I had a chance to speak with some of you in the reception, and uh, this is an issue that is getting people fired up. In my time speaking with you tonight, uh, I'd like to, you to leave the room, to leave this event with a few things. Uh, I'd like you to have a solid understanding of critical race theory. I'd like you to be able to define it and define its principles. And then most importantly, I'd like you to figure out how critical race theory assumes and expands its bureaucratic power and what you can do to fight it. Um, because it's one thing to understand something intellectually, you're attending like a, a, a college uh, seminar, uh, but it's another thing when it starts to infect you, it starts to affect your kids, your family members, your workplace. Uh, and that's what I've seen over and over the past year of reporting on critical race theory. Uh, but I'd also like you to leave with a sense of hope. And sometimes it feels like all of the institutions have been captured by ideologies like critical race theory, critical gender theory, critical pedagogy, critical you name it. Um, but there are concrete things that you can do at the very local level that are going to have a big impact for people in your community. So I thought I'd just start a bit of my own personal story, um, exactly how I started working on this issue and then consequently this became a national issue. Um, a year and a half ago, 18 months ago, more or less, name recognition for critical race theory was approximately zero. About zero percent of Americans knew about critical race theory. If you'd round down from the maybe 10,000, maybe 20,000, maybe a little bit more, of people who had studied critical race theory uh, uh, and then started to promote it in the institutions, maybe a few hundred thousand people, were really versed in this theory. At the same time, as I discovered in my reporting and as many people have discovered in their communities, um, this ideology that combines a lot of disparate elements but then is united and crystallized as critical race theory has taken on an increasingly prominent place in American life. And in fact, I made the argument last summer that despite few people knowing about it, critical race theory had become the dominant ideology of American institutions, especially elite institutions in academia, in teacher training, even in the federal government. But it all began for me with an email from a confidential source, at that time an anonymous source, who said, Chris, you've been reporting on homelessness, progressive ideology, crime, all sorts of disasters in West Coast cities, like Seattle, where I live, uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles. And this source said, you should really check out what's happening inside the Seattle Office of Civil Rights. And okay, what, what, what do you mean? And he said, they're doing racially segregated training programs for new employees. And they're having a separate training program for white employees uh, on interrupting whiteness and internalized racial superiority. And this, as a curious person, as a you know, documentary filmmaker, as a journalist, um, it had that spark. It had a question mark. So I'm thinking, well, geez, that sounds, that sounds pretty interesting. You have a office of civil rights, racially segregating employees, kind of irony. Um, and then you have something called interrupting whiteness and internalized racial superiority. So I filed a records request and I promptly forgot about it, just, just left my mind. And you know how the government goes, it's a bit of a process. Um, and then I get a, a kind of note and it says, you know, you, your records request has been fulfilled. And I get uh, two CD-ROMs. You guys remember CD-ROMs? The disc with the hole in it? Um, I'm 37. I, I still remember it. I, I burned some CDs uh, in my day, as many of you probably did as well. Um, but I don't actually have a CD-ROM device. I don't have a drive. I don't have a player. And so I called a friend of mine and said, hey, I got these CD-ROMs. Do you have a CD-ROM player? <laughs> I can't get to these documents that are on this CD. A couple days later, a friend of mine comes over, hey, thanks for coming over. And what I found on those discs unfolds the entire story about critical race theory. And it was the start of going from about 0% name recognition 
to now about 75% name recognition among American voters. So in the course of this year, from that fateful CD-ROM, now to this resounding victory in Virginia by Glenn Youngkin, we have educated 175 million Americans about critical race theory. There were some big assists, certainly, um, after I started promoting, working on these stories, I focused on a series of stories after Seattle uh, in the federal agencies, important places like the FBI, uh, the De Department of Justice, the Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve, all of these elite institutions, I started developing sources within them, who felt too afraid to speak out on their own who felt like if they were to speak out to their superiors or the directors of these agencies, even under President Trump, remember there was a different president last year, they felt so afraid to speak out on their own, but they said, you know, we saw this guy, Chris Rufo, on Fox or on Twitter, um, and maybe we can send the documents to him, and maybe he can sound the alarm on our behalf. And so, really by accident, I became the repository of critical race theory in American institutions. I now have a database of more than 5,000 sources in local, state, and federal institutions all over this country. Most of them aren't newsworthy. They're, you know, kind of minor, marginal. But some of them were explosive stories. And so last year I set about on releasing these stories week after week after week, really raising the alarm, what's happening, not just within our federal government, but within our federal government during an administration, the Trump administration, that was ostensibly hostile to this ideology. They were using their power in the permanent bureaucracy. They were bringing in uh, former Communist Party fellow travelers uh, to train bureaucrats at Treasury, the federal financial institutions, and other places, teaching them that, that America was a fundamentally and irredeemably racist country, forcing white employees to apologize for their skin color, and even taking, in one pretty atrocious story, America's top nuclear weapons engineers working at the Sandia National Laboratories in New Mexico, segregating them by race and sex, and telling the white male engineers that they had to attend a three-day white male re-education program. And over the course of these three days, as I learned through the leaked documents, they were teaching these employees, people in charge of something fairly important, our nuclear weapons, um, that being a white male was equivalent to being a KKK member, to be part of the Aryan Nation white supremacist prison gang, there were some funny ones. They said that white men can't jump. That was, uh, I can concede that was kind of funny. Um, but they were basically building the case that these men who had served their country as engineers, as, as, as designing our nuclear arsenal to protect us from foreign adversaries, that they had white privilege, male privilege, heterosexual privilege. And once they established their guilt collectively, they forced these men to recite a series of more than 100 white privilege statements, male privilege statements, and heterosexual privilege statements, admitting in front of their colleagues that they were complicit in racism and sexism and other forms of bigotry. And finally, they forced them to write letters of apology, simply because of who they were, to fictitious personalities, women, people of color, apologizing for who they were. Obviously, this is a tremendous waste of taxpayer money. But more than that, it shows in one small example the, what I learned to be this pervasive re-education effort that no one had talked about, no one had reported on, and yet, as I found, was in all of our highest positions of power. So the first big assist in this reporting campaign was Tucker Carlson, a great American. Any fans? Yeah. One thing that's great about Tucker is that he's always on the lookout for new talent, for new stories, for new ideas. He's not afraid to get out there, as you've probably seen. And so Tucker invited me on his show, and he said, you know, I 
broke some of these stories, broke another one, broke another one. They were driving tens of millions of media impressions. And then the producers called me and they said, hey, Chris, Tucker wants you to deliver the opening monologue jointly with him tonight. And Tucker's first eight to 10 minutes is the most watched television and cable news. You, any monologue fans? Yeah, of course. And so I said, this is great. This is a huge opportunity. And I set about writing a script. I drove up to the studio in downtown Seattle. You know, they were going to have a teleprompter ready, so Tucker would set me up, and then I would deliver a three and a half minute part of the monologue. <laughs> Something unfortunate happened. Uh, the studio in Seattle got their wires crossed. They didn't have a teleprompter. Um, and so we're about 30 minutes before showtime. And they said, hey, you know, Chris, um, there's no teleprompter. You're just going to have to wing it for three and a half minutes. You're just going to have to go by instinct. Um, and so I was a little upset, a little scared, not to be, I'll admit it. Um, and then something really beautiful happened. Something, I think, uh, inspired happened. Um, Tucker sets it up. I start talking. I actually blacked out for three and a half minutes. I don't remember it at all. Um, I, I, I really, truly kind of don't remember it. Um, but then I, towards the end, I, I come to, like, a, like out of a, out of a, a haze. Um, and then I said, you know what? Part of the problem in politics and part of the problem for conservatives, frankly, is that we don't ask for what we want. We don't just say, this is what I want. This is what we should do. And so I did something that some people kind of mocked me for later that night. I said, you know, I, I call on the president. There was a, there was a, a, at the time, President Trump, who theoretically would not be happy about this stuff. I said, you know, I call on the president to immediately issue an executive order banning critical race theory trainings from the federal government. And that was the closing argument. You just have to ask. You just have to ask. Little did, our, our former president, um, he watched a lot of television. Uh, and so he was watching at that time. And I could feel it. I could feel it at the end of the segment. I really could. I know it sounds crazy. But I could feel that something had clicked. And so I'm in Seattle, so it's East, uh, West Coast time. Very early in the morning, the next morning, I get a phone call from a 202 area code number. You guys know 202. It's not Trump, don't worry. That would have been great. But it is Mark Meadows' his chief of staff. He says, hey, Christopher, the president saw you on television last night on Tucker. He's instruct instructed me to take immediate action to ban critical race theory from the federal government. <laughs> Amazing. And I thought, this is, this, I can't believe that worked. <laughs> that was amazing. And so, to the president's immense credit, later I learned, working with the administration, I shared my research, I shared some ideas. Um, later I learned that an executive order typically takes, at minimum, six months to get through the process. The White House, the Department of Justice, the communications team. President Trump was different. Um, President Trump got this done from watching Tucker Carlson to signing the executive order in the Oval Office in 21 days. Which is extraordinary. And so this is all by way of background. And then it becomes an issue. He delivers a, an, a really beautiful speech at the National Archives talking about the perversion of American history, the threat of critical race theory, um, and restoring a, a, an honest and accurate and patriotic education. And all of a sudden, it becomes a national issue. And over the course of the last year, it's been ping-ponged. Uh, President Biden, first day in office, rescinded the Trump executive order. Um, then I started working on a series of stories because I had all these sources in K-12 schools. And I'll tell you, if it's terrifying that our nuclear weapons engineers are participating in race re-education camps, it's really terrifying to see what's happened to our kids. And I know that MacGyver Institute has worked on this issue locally and found many examples of the critical race ideology being taught in schools in this state, even in this area. And so we had a battle over the last year, a battle between truth and lies. 
The truth of the matter, as I showed and then many other reporters showed, is that critical race theory is the dominant ideological framework in graduate schools of education that train teachers, and the dominant ideological imperative and pedagogy in many of the nation's largest school districts. The city of Seattle has a school district of Seattle, for example, has a full-time critical race theorist. Um, it's embedded in the curriculum in New York, in Chicago, in Seattle, in San Francisco, and other large districts. But it's also made its way into suburban and even rural areas and red states. And so we report on this over and over and over, all original source documents, some of the most salacious uh, and shocking and provocative stories of kids as young as eight years old being forced to deconstruct their racial and sexual identities and then rank themselves according to their power and privilege, turning them against one another in this perverse racial and sexual hierarchy, explicitly using critical race theory. To a public school in New York City, for example, that sent an email to white parents saying that they should become, quote, white traitors and advocate for full white abolition. This is drawing from a theorist named Noel Ignatiev who set a mission of himself at Harvard Graduate School of Education to, quote, abolish the white race. And this sounds serious, it sounds scary, it sounds, frankly, uh, 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 a bit ex kind of exterminationist in its rhetoric. And then what we have is the other side. How do the critical race theorists defend this kind of rhetoric? They play language games. Anyone come across the language games? A little frustrating. So they'll say, well, 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 when we say abolish the white race, we mean abolish the white race as a social construct, not abolish individual human beings. When we say that uh, whiteness is inherently racist and oppressive, we mean that the metaphysical category of whiteness as it's perpetuated itself throughout American history is fundamentally racist, but actual white people are, some of them are fine. Uh, and so it's a great dance. And even to the point where, and this, I'll, I'll, be, I'll admit, this bothered me for a few months. Um, they denied that critical race theory even existed. Did you catch this? Yeah. It's like I've read 10,000 pages of academic literature in critical race theory. It exists. You have textbook after textbook after textbook. There are a dozen huge textbooks on how to apply critical race theory to K-12 education. I've poured through thousands of pages of curricular documents. It's been the principles of critical race theory are enshrined in the official state curriculum in Illinois, California, Oregon, and Washington. We have a full-time critical race theorist at the city of Seattle. We have school districts like Springfield, Missouri, where they're teaching the explicit principles of critical race theory to middle school, elementary school, high school teachers. And so we have been fighting for a year. And thankfully, as we've demonstrated the evidence as we've educated 175 million Americans about critical race theory, the polling data indicates that we've gone from 0% recognition and early in the year Heritage Foundation commissioned a poll, not exactly left-leaning Heritage Foundation, uh, where they found that critical race theory was popular among the American public, I think in January of this year. But then we engaged on a relentless journalistic campaign I know that even just my own journalistic work generated close to 500 million media impressions over the past year and always backed up with hard evidence. And so now, fast forward a year later, the polling data indicates that among voters with an opinion about critical race theory, which is about three quarters, it's a two to one, by a two to one margin, the American voters oppose it in public schools. And then, and then you'll hear whining and belly aching. Well, the, from the New York Times, you know, the, the, the fainting couch uh, reporters at the New York Times. Um, well, this is, you know, white backlash. It's white resentment. Um, this is white fragility that proves how important critical race theory really is. 
There's only one problem. There's no evidence to support that. And in fact, my organization, Manhattan Institute, we commissioned a poll in America's 20 fastest growing cities. These are places that are diversifying, places that are growing, places that have a lot of young families. And something really amazing, when you segment it out, they asked parents to say, do you support critical race theory in public schools? Do you support teaching systemic racism, white privilege, etc.?" Parents, when you drill down to parents, of all racial backgrounds, when you put them together, oppose critical race theory in public schools by an incredible 42-point margin. 42-point margin. If anyone's in politics, if you have an issue where you're winning them on a 42-point margin among a key voting demographic, that's actually good. Uh, that's quite strong. But what I was really interested in was actually looking deeper in this analysis and to try to say, well, who? Conservatives are fired up. I imagine most of you, conservatives, fired up about this. Independents, more than three quarters of independents also said, no, no, we don't want this. That's the swing voters. And then even a sizable number of left liberals or Democrats tell pollsters, hey, this has gone too far. We want equality, we want justice, we want freedom. We don't want racialist indoctrination in public schools. And this evidence indicates that it's not just white parents, as the New York Times would have you believe, engaging in a white backlash. They don't want to teach about slavery. They don't want to teach about history. Those are all lies. And in fact, Asian and Latino parents oppose critical race theory by the same margin as white parents. And even African-American parents, who admittedly have the most favorable numbers to critical race theory, a majority oppose it in public schools. So you have white, black, Asian, and Latino people, parents, voters, all oppose it. And I guess who's on the other side? It's the New York Times, it's uh, the Washington Post, it's the Harvard faculty, um, it's bureaucrats. But what I'd like to do is um, give you the tools, the power, and the knowledge so that you can be a voice in this community. And so I'd like to just start with five key principles that are distilled from critical race theory. Because oftentimes the language game, and you probably heard it, is they say, well, we're not teaching critical race theory. There's no course in our elementary school that says critical race theory at the top. And it's like, well, you know, <laughs> we're teaching, you know, Genesis, Mark, John, Luke, but we're not teaching the Bible. It doesn't say Bible anywhere, <laughs> you know. So my argument is a way to get around this is to say, Call it what you want, but we found that you're teaching the principles of critical race theory. So just that shift, subtle shift in language to say, well, I'm concerned we're teaching the principles of critical race theory. You can avoid that top-level shell game and get down to the content. Because it doesn't matter what it's called, if they call it critical race theory, if they call it diversity and inclusion, a particularly Orwellian formulation, um, if they call it culturally responsive teaching, totally misleading, it doesn't really matter. What is the substance? What are the actual principles and ideas and concepts that you're promoting in the classroom? And then once we've dialed those down, then we can actually do the research and find out where they come from. And so I would suggest to you that there are five key principles to really be thinking about as you're looking at critical race theory. One is the, I think, the foundational principle, the idea of whiteness. Is that kind of a new, maybe strange word for some of you? Whiteness, right? So the, 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 the suffix, the, the ness, is, a, is like a state of being, right? Um, it's a state of, it's an explanation of how the world works. And for the critical race theorists, they lay this out over and over, patiently, over about 30 years. Uh, for them, whiteness is a metaphysical category. It's uh, how the world is. It's how the world uh, uh, behaves. It's the essence to which our society can be reduced. They argue that the United States is a society based on whiteness, white racial identity, uh, unearned benefits, uh, even this idea that was 
really central to critical race theory, whiteness as property. They argued in the early 1990s that, race, that the, the, the racial essence of European Americans, white, their whiteness, was actually a form of property interest. That you have a form of unearned racial metaphysical wealth uh, that, is div- that, is, that is passed along because of uh, how our society perpetuates and, and, and supports whiteness. And therefore, the argument goes, we'll get this, into this a bit later, the only way to dismantle whiteness is also to dismantle private property. So by dismantling private property, then you can also dismantle the, the oppressive racial regime at the heart of the United States. Whiteness. Two, intersectionality. Very big Latinate word, right? Very fancy. What is intersectionality? Anyone know? Yes, okay. Very well, you've done your homework. A plus. Um, Intersectionality is, on the surface, it's a way of categorizing people by identity. So it really is identity politics translated into academic jargon. The idea that is that you as a human being can be reduced to the intersection of various identity categories. Race, sex, gender, language, religion, uh, BMI, like your body mass index, um, the latecomer in the critical theories, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they're teaching this explicitly in elementary schools even, the theory of intersectionality, teaching kids how to categorize themselves by intersectionality and categorize their classmates by intersectionality. So it's no longer your classmates who each have an individual name, an individual story. You're seeing the world through a hierarchy of oppressor and oppressed. And so although they they don't like to admit it, um, again, we have the evidence. They admitted it quite freely uh, when they were getting started. Critical race theory is a neo-Marxist ideology. The founder of CRT, Kimberly Crenshaw, admits this over and over in early interviews where she says we came up with this theory by pairing critical theory, neo-Marxism, with racial justice, activism, race, critical race theory. They even say, you know, when we first got started, it was actually right here in the state of Wisconsin. They held the first critical race theory conference. Uh, in a convent, um, of all places. And they said, it's ha ha ha, very funny, a bunch of Marxists creating a new ideology in a convent. They say this. And so the, the innovation of intersectionality is two things. One, it's hierarchy. So, uh, so creating a hierarchy that should be subverted or reversed or overturned. Um, but it's also replacing the old, tired, stale, failed Marxist dialectic of oppressor and oppressed, which used to be, you know, cigar-chomping capitalists versus, uh, you know, kind of uh, besooted mine workers and industrial workers. In the 1960s, the Marxists said, you know what, this is not going to work. Actually, American industrial workers are very happy. They have a rising standard of a living. Um, They're not only not revolutionary, they're anti-revolutionary. They're one of the most conservative elements of American society. We need to find another entry point to achieve the revolution. And so they set about and settled on the axis not of class, but the axis of race. Intersectionality takes that old Marxist idea. It takes the identity politics of the 1960s and 70s and then puts it into a $100 word, intersectionality. Third, systemic racism. And this is a brilliant, I'll give them credit, this is a brilliant phrase. It's very menacing, it sounds really awful. Um, All of us would oppose it, everyone would oppose it, it's kind of natural, well, there's systemic racism, why oppose it? But it is so vague, it's so vacuous, that it is a, a signifier that could mean anything. Systemic racism, okay, well, you know, is the law discriminating against individuals on the basis of race, which has been the case in the United States in, 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 in our history. Of course, we should condemn that. But you see systemic racism gets applied further and further out. 
until um, even the very common phrases that we use are systemically racist. You might have systemically racist unconscious thoughts that can be dredged up for $625 an hour by a diversity consultant. Um, I mean, you know, you can't say, you know, he's gone off the reservation. That's systemically racist. Um, a whole new th- category of, of sometimes even subliminal things that are systemically racist. And so what is systemic racism? How does it function in, in critical race theory? It's their vision of the American society. Does that make sense? It's not just that there is systemic racism that we need to eliminate, that we need to reform, that we need to improve. They argue very explicitly that America, since the founding, has been, currently is, and always will be systemically racist. So if you accept the premise, the loaded linguistic premise of systemic racism, embedded into that is already the conclusion provided by the critical race theorists that the country is irredeemably systemically racist. What's holding people back from overcoming this society of systemic racism, according to the CRT scholars and activists? One of my favorites, uh, CRT terms. Again, think about this in the curriculum. White privilege. You guys remember that? Where does white privilege come from? I mean, where does the, the phrase, the idea come from? It doesn't come from Robin DiAngelo, good guess. It actually comes from the late 1960s. It comes from a Communist Party USA member named Noel Ignatiev, who came up with that charming phrase, abolish the white race. He really pioneered in a piece uh, in 1967 the idea of white skin privilege. And then it was put into application by another charming group called the Weather Underground. You remember them? All right, too young, I'm too young, but uh, I read a lot. Um, So the Weather Underground was the first mainstream activist organization, well, mainstream, the first, Jesus, they're mainstream now, Um, uh, but they were the first activist organization to really implement white privilege training. They had what they, they, they read from Chairman Mao's Little Red Book, they read from Noel Ignatiev's Theory of White Skin Privilege, and they started very ruthlessly subjecting one another to what they called criticism and self-criticism sessions, trying to unearth their white privilege, to say that the only way we can achieve revolution, socialist, Marxist revolution in the United States, is to bankrupt our white privilege. And so they started interrogating one another about their white privilege. This theory subsides for a period of time, Ignatiev goes to Harvard Graduate School of Education, the Weather Underground surfaces by the early 1980s, and gets professorships, including at some flagship universities not too far from here. And so that, I, that idea, which was literally an idea practiced by lunatics and convicted domestic terrorists who by the early 1980s had murdered police officers while commissioning a bank robbery, armored car robbery, are now filtering through the university system, filtering through bureaucracy, through HR departments, and filtering down so that kids in potentially all 50 states are reenacting, granted, a watered-down version of the criticism and self-criticism routine. The idea being that Because you start with the metaphysics of whiteness, the society is systemically racist, you judge your position by intersectionality, the thing that is holding back the revolution or liberation is people unwilling to give up their white skin privilege, uh, unwilling to give up their positions of power, their wealth, their property, etc. And so that is the great nemesis in this ideology. So what is the solution? Last point. The solution is abolition. You guys heard abolition, that word? Anyone heard it? There's a couple, there's a couple similar words they use. Abolition, decolonization, liberation. 
All of those are euphemisms for the old 70s, 60s, 70s term of revolution. The idea is that the United States can't be redeemed unless it's decolonized. The idea is that the United States can't be redeemed unless it's abolished. And so when you look at their literature, you say, well, what do these folks want? You look at the literature and you find out, well, they want to abolish the First Amendment very clearly. They said First Amendment, uh, you know, people should be arrested and prosecuted for speech that is not anti-racist. Get rid of the First Amendment. The Fourteenth Amendment, which guarantees the equal protection under the law to each individual citizen, they want to abolish that one because they would rather have a system of group identity-based rights rather than individual rights. As we discussed, they want to get rid of private property and capitalism altogether. They believe that you can't eliminate racism without also eliminating capitalism and private property. They even want to eliminate, in a kind of twist, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which promises a colorblind vision of justice. They reject colorblindness. They think it's oppressive. They think it's racist. They think it's a way of tricking people into feeling like they might have freedom and equality, whereas the system of capitalism and racial domination proceeds underneath it. And so those are the big five. And I'm giving you the kind of heavy academic stuff. I'm, thanks for bearing with me. Because you have to know where it comes from. When you see that your kid is have a cartoon book talking about their whiteness, you have to know what that actually means. You have to know where it comes from, what it means, and what its intentions are. When you hear about intersectionality, when you hear about systemic racism, white privilege, abolition, liberation, decolonization, they're filtered through euphemism, they're filtered through bureaucracy, they're filtered through uh, school district administrators, many of whom don't really know what they're putting into the curriculum. They don't understand where it comes from. But now you do. And so when you see these terms, when you see these ideas and concepts being taught, even if they're seeming innocuous in their presentation, you now know what they truly mean. And so what do you do about it? Anyone? There you go. You fight it. So the question is how? Um, and, and I think that this is a question that for me was vexing at the beginning. I didn't know what to do, so I asked the president to do something about it, uh, like, a, like a small child. Uh, this is a big problem. I'm going to ask the president. Uh, <laughs> that one's not going to work anymore. Uh, I don't think uh, President Joe is going to take action. Um, so given that at the federal level there is no chance of reforms, what I've seen in the last six to nine months is something that has been unprecedented, astonishing, and absolutely inspiring. We've seen millions of American parents doing records requests, finding out what's being taught to their kids, listening in to those interminable Zoom sessions as kids were forced to out of the classroom and into the home. They weren't happy with what they saw and they have revived American democracy by getting involved. And what does that look like? It looks like average people getting organized in their communities and to say, you know what, wherever our national politics might be, these are our institutions, these are our kids, these are our workplaces, these are our churches. They're doing the homework, they're learning about critical race theory, they're developing a vocabulary, how to express themselves. And then over the course of the spring and summer, something really beautiful happened. You started seeing these viral videos of parents at school board meetings. Did you see those? Yeah. yeah. Good. And some of you might have been even in the viral videos. I don't know. I can't see you, but... But what you saw was... What you see in those videos is moral clarity. For too long, many conservatives and many 
centrist, centrist, even center-left liberals have felt intimidated by this ideology. They didn't know where it comes from. They didn't know the language. They were bullied into accepting it, knowing intuitively that something was not right. But there's a difference between hearing what's happening on campus at Yale and what's happening in your elementary school. And so the political left did something bold, aggressive, but ultimately fatal. They crossed between parent and child. And if you're a mother, if you're a father, the reaction when someone does that, when someone crosses between you and your child, when someone is hurting your kid, whatever fear that you had at one time vanishes. You're going to go all out. And that's what we've seen. We've seen parents of all racial backgrounds, of all political stripes, in places like New York City, San Francisco, Boston, not so much Seattle yet. Um, in all of these places, in all of these suburban and small town environments, to say, we didn't vote for this, we didn't approve this, you never came to us telling us what you were doing, you're using your status and power within the bureaucracy to impose this ideology on our kids without our permission. And so what we've seen is this organic narrative that has developed among parents who can bring evidence, can bring documentation. And I had a very interesting experience. I'll, I'll tell you a bit about it. I was sat down for an interview with a, for a book by an Oxford University professor just last week. And, and uh, he said, hey, I'm interviewing about racial politics in America. He said, I'm interviewing a lot of people, some famous left-wing people, some right-wing people. And I said, hey, what's the scoop with the left-wing people? And he says, Chris, they're in total disarray. They had no idea what hit them. They couldn't formulate a narrative to fight it. They find themselves on the defensive with millions of parents, upset at what's happening. They went from having seized the initiative in 2020. They went from exerting street dominance everywhere. Minneapolis, Milwaukee, San Francisco, Portland, Oregon, maybe still. Um, in all of these places where they thought that we now have power, our ideology is now dominant, we control the institutions, to now getting a thorough rebuke from millions of American parents. And so what can you do? What can your neighbors do? What can your friends do? First and foremost, we have 50 states in this country. They all have legislatures. And I'm really proud of what's happened here in this state. This state is, was the first state to pass what we're calling curriculum transparency legislation through the House and the Senate. <laughs> that had one very simple premise, one very simple idea. Parents have the right to know what's being taught to their children. Are we in a, is it really too bad that we have to assert that? That's not just obvious? That's not the status quo? Yeah, of course. But that's a powerful argument. Who can argue against it? A parent has the right to know what's being taught to his or her children. In a public school with the power of compulsion, right? The public schools can force your kids to attend. The very least they could do is provide transparency as to what they're teaching. And so this state, your governor vetoed it. Fine, F fine, you know, fair, agree. But, but you laid down a marker, not just for the state, but for the whole country. You really did. I mean, this is a historic achievement. Yeah. And so don't stop fighting. Governors come and go. Maybe this one will go. Um, and know that you guys are setting, that you, the people of this state, are setting the precedent for all other states. And uh, I've been in conversations with many legislators and governors in the last few weeks. Um, don't tell anyone. Fox Nation, don't tell anyone. Um, uh, this is going to be the issue in state legislatures 
when they're back in session in January and February. Uh, I, I anticipate in my role as a, as a I don't do elected uh, 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 po electoral politics, but in my role as a policy analyst, nonpartisan, um, I think that we're going to see curriculum transparency legislation get passed in somewhere between 10 and 20 states next year. Yeah. And then I hope we add it in this one after that. Okay, there's that, state level. You, guys, you have tried it. The state, is, Wisconsin has tried it, made a heroic effort. What else can you do? Uh, the heart and soul of this is local parent activism. This is a parent movement. This is a movement that is not funded, although I wish it had more funding, by right-wing billionaires. Um, if there are any here, please help us out. It's really a grassroots effort of people who care, of people who want to see their institutions function, of people who want to prioritize education over indoctrination. And so what can you do as parents? First, to get educated. You now know the five principles of critical race theory. You know what it's about. You know the definitions. There's a couple things specifically that you can now do. The most powerful tool that we have is information. There's a reason that the reporting that I did was able to generate so much uh, uh, audience, so much excitement, so much passion, is because I had new information that exposed to the sunlight exactly what was happening in our institutions. And you have that power here. So start doing those public records requests or FOIA requests where you can ask what's happening in the curriculum, ask what's happening in the training programs. You can limit it by keywords saying, hey, here are the five or 10 or 20 keywords. I want all of your documents and PDFs and communications that involve this. You know, be targeted where you can if you sense there may be something happening. You know, a lot of times these folks operate so deeply in the shadows that they'll write all of this stuff via email and you can actually get their emails. You can say, I want the school board president's emails every time they mention white privilege. See if there's anything in there, go fishing. That information is tremendously powerful because you can rebut their specious claims that critical race theory doesn't exist, that it's the Loch Ness Monster, it's Bigfoot, it's, uh, you know, in your imagination with actual hard evidence. Um, the other thing you can do is you can actually advocate for curriculum transparency, not at the state level, but at the school board level, right? So you can persuade your school board. I've actually created model school board resolution in my work with Manhattan Institute to do exactly this, where your school board can pass a local resolution requiring their teachers and administrators to post all documents, curricula, lesson plans, and materials directly so parents can look at it online. That's an option. You can do that at the local level. And then finally, I, I think that it really comes down to this is Personnel is policy. So the people who are running school boards make the decisions. And if you're unhappy with what's happening in your local school board, run a pressure campaign to get the superintendent out. There are some fierce moms, I wouldn't want to cross these folks, in, in Westchester County, New York. They ran a pressure campaign and they're just booting superintendent after superintendent. They've created an environment where if you're going to go way out there with critical race theory, your career is going to end abruptly and prematurely. The other thing you can do, and uh, a colleague of mine recently ran, I think, 75 school board races, won, and he won something like 55 of them, um, run for school board. You can actually get in touch with parents at low cost that care about this issue. Um, and if you can, in many school boards, a few thousand votes, um, you can actually win. You can actually replace an incumbent. You can win an open seat. And then when the personnel changes, the policy can change. But before we take the q and I'd like to just leave with uh, a note of optimism because I'm, I'm very optimistic. I'm fired up. You know, it seems like sometimes that we're fighting against all of the institutions. Have you noticed that? Yeah. We're fighting against the universities. We're fighting against the 
media corporations, we're fighting against the bureaucracy, the teachers unions, this entire constellation of political power that seems to be more and more entrenched. But what the parent movement has demonstrated is proof of life. If you've ever watched a, uh, a bank robbery movie um, or a kidnapping movie, they always make you hold the newspaper with the date on it. You understand what I'm saying? With the, uh, so you can prove that you're actually alive. Um, to me, the, the parent movement in America today is proof of life for our country. It's proof of life for our constitutional republic. It's proof of life for our democracy. Because the fight right now is not necessarily between left and right. As I said, vast majorities of people oppose critical race theory. The fight right now is between institutional elites that have hijacked our public institutions that are financed by your taxpayer dollars to promote their private ideological dreams and fantasies. And so it is a battle between these entrenched, corrupt, bureaucratic elites and the great mass of American people, American families, American parents, who just want what we've always wanted. We want to be treated fairly. We want to have the freedom to pursue what we see as the greatest good. We want to have public institutions that serve public purposes. We want to have the potential so that when our kids go to school, we know that they're safe, we know that they're learning, we know that they're being prepared for their future. And so this is the fight. This is the fight that is the crux of American politics today. Is it about critical race theory, no critical race theory? Yeah, it is at the surface level. But there's something that's much deeper that's happening. This is a fight for the soul of our democracy. This is a fight that will determine who wins, the bureaucrats or the people, the teachers' unions or the families. And so I think that if you are inspired to fight, uh, get out there, be relentless, always be peaceful, always be respectful, but don't be afraid to let your passion free. Don't be afraid to show up and put a line in the sand. Don't be afraid to fight for what you believe in uh, because everything is on the line. And I know in the more that I travel, the more that I speak with people, the more that I see the courageous activity from parents and state legislators and people even in D.C. in the highest positions in office are marveling at what you're doing. They're looking at this parent movement and you're inspiring them. So I just really appreciate it. Get out there, keep fighting. I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Christopher.